Four years have passed since the mortal races gathered together in Anaheim, California. <laughs> and now the drums of BlizzCon thunder once again. Let me hear the thunder! Yes! Ah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the World of Warcraft What's Next panel. My name is Taryn Gregory, and as maybe you may have heard, <laughs> thank you. As, as you may have heard from Chris during the opening ceremonies, we are at the dawn of a new era of Warcraft. The World Soul Saga. A story that will play out over the next three expansions and will take us on an adventure in World of Warcraft like we've never experienced before. This saga kicks off with the War Within. In this first chapter, our heroes will be called on an expedition to the subterranean depths of Azeroth, revealing a new world full of mystery, wonder, and darkness. There we will confront the shadows below and face new challenges on the battlefield as well as in ourselves. So what is next? During this section, I'll share an overview of the story of the War Within, and then next you'll hear from the, uh, Maria Hamilton, who will speak to zones and cultures, and then wrapping up with Morgan Day, who will talk about dungeons, the raid, and our new systems. Let's dig in. In our cinematic reveal, did you guys uh, enjoy the cinematic? <laughs> Big shout out to the cinematic team for their work on that. It's just incredible work. Um, uh, we witnessed as Thrall found Anduin Rin, who has been wandering alone for the last few years, grappling and lost in his own thoughts and dealing with the experience that he's been through, as many of you may have remembered. Throughout this and our features trailer, we learned two very important developments, starting with these visions. Thrall spoke of a vision calling out from the heart of the world, like a voice from a dream. This radiant song will compel our heroes to investigate its origins, and while at the same time, a darkness has been gathering. Even as the heroes adventured on the Dragon Isles, and in the war within, the mysterious harbinger that Eridicron spoke of will reveal themselves, Zalatath has returned. Freed long ago from the black blade that once bound her, she is now the harbinger of a new era of the Void's dark machinations. And her message is clear. The Black Empire has fallen. The old gods are dead. And their ancient blood runs deep within the cracks of the world. We, the heroes of Azeroth, destroyed them. <laughs> The forces of the Horde and the Alliance have proven time and again they are among the most powerful armies that have ever stood. The Harbinger has watched this. She is patient. And while the Black Empire failed, Zalatath now seeks to set in motion the rise of a new dark legacy, one that knows our true strength and will seek to test it against a new threat of terrible power, the Nerubians of Ashkahet. Zalatath has conscripted the Nerubian queen Anserek, having offered her people a new future, one in which they will rise from their isolation as a mighty kingdom once again. And here in this sprawling city of Ashkahet, we will not find the undead soldiers of the Lich King that we faced before, but instead a new mighty stronghold of the Nerubians as they once were, deadly survivors of the mythic wars that have played out time and again over thousands of years. In return for their loyalty, Zalatath has granted the Nerubians the means of a dark evolution, one that will turn the Nerubians into a new kind of ferocious and terrifying soldier that we will clash against time and again in the War Within. Now let's talk about who we'll be adventuring with. How do you like the key art? <laughs> <laughs> Several of Azeroth's greatest heroes will rise to the call of the Radiant Song, and many will be faced with their own unique challenges. Anduin, having survived his deal or deal with domination. Yes, look at the art. Oh, incredible artwork. Anduin will be grappling with his relationship to the holy light that he no longer feels worthy of, while Thrall is seeking a connection to these visions, spreading across the world and working to find his new place in the Horde. 
while Magni Bronzebeard, long the Speaker of Azeroth, will confront the heavy weight of that responsibility once and for all. <laughs> champion! The wounds champion! Yes! <laughs> but that brings us to, I know you saw this in the uh, features trailer, uh, Alaria Windrunner. <laughs> Alaria's journey will be central to the events of the themes of the War Within, as she, a void hunter, will use all of her prowess to hunt down the Harbinger while being torn between her own nature and the maddening call of the Void to which she is attuned. Along the adventure, she will have a unique rivalry with Zalatath, whose twists and turns will come to define the nature of this new conflict. Of course, we'll see many more familiar faces on our journey and meet a host of new and interesting characters along the way that Maria is gonna tell you more about in just a moment. But finally, this saga is only just beginning. Conceived to be... <laughs> yes! Conceived to be an epic worthy of the first 20 years of World of Warcraft, the World Soul Saga aims to redefine the storytelling in our expansion set and strike boldly at the core themes that define Warcraft. The might of heroes, the responsibility of that power, the pursuit of justice. Got to do my best Mets in there. Justice! <laughs> and the importance of finding common ground as well as ourselves amidst adversity. Up next, may I introduce Maria Hamilton, who will be sharing more about our zones and cultures in the war within. Thank you so much. Hello, BlizzCon. Wow, I am so excited to be here and delighted to represent our team and tell you about the places that we will explore and the cultures we will encounter in the war within. I can't really see all of you out there. I know there's a lot of you, though, because I can hear you. And I hope to hear lots of oohs and ahs when you see some of this cool art I've got to show you. So let's get started. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, yep, yep, thank you. Okay, as Taryn mentioned earlier, we'll be called by the Radiant Song, dreamlike visions that come from the heart of the Azeroth. This summons is going to lead us to the subcontinent of Kaz Algar, a place long forgotten. It, it, <laughs> it's only through recent explorations in Oldemon that we've discovered a Watcher report concerning a contingent of earthen that was sent to this place long, long ago to investigate a fissure in the sector. What exactly that means, we don't really know, but we could probably speculate. So first, let's talk about the earthen. Ooh, ah, there you go, there you go. All right, we have met Titan-forged earthen before, of course, in Ulduar and other places, but this society of earthen has been isolated within Kaz Algar for a really long time and have developed their own manners and customs. Now visually these earthen are a bit larger in stature and they're noticeably blinged out. They've got gems all over them, bedazzled, blinged out, you know, that kind of thing, right? But philosophically they are guided by the Edicts of the Titans, a set of codified orders, duties, and expectations that provide instructions for the core functions of their society. You know, Titans, order, all that, right? But the Titans have been absent for eons, and the Ursin are no longer united in their adherence to these edicts. They now exist as three groups that are estranged from each other. The Oathsworn, as their name suggests, still uphold the edicts faithfully and believe everyone else is doing it wrong. Their charge is guarding the Coreway, a Titan passageway that leads right to the core of Azeroth. They're primarily the city dwellers. They live conveniently near the object of their responsibility, that core way. Now the unbound, in contrast, have abandoned the edicts, and they are considered scandalously rebellious by the Oath Swarm. Their original responsibility was providing the materials to keep the Titan installations supplied, and they're primarily rural. They're living in and around the quarries and the mines where natural resources can be acquired. 
They rarely interact with the city dwellers. They feel neglected and ignored because they have a different opinion on how they should live. Now, the machine speakers have strayed from the edicts in practice, but not with respect to their overall obligation to keep the Titan works functioning. They've had extremely limited contact with the surface dwellers, and they express no little disdain for those who just don't understand the great machines. Their homes are built around vast industrial projects under the surface that allow them to perform their functions in accordance with edicts, more or less. These different perspectives among the earthen and their variable adherence to the Titan's edicts has weakened the society as originally structured. And that's not good, of course, but a much more serious problem is their steadily dwindling numbers. For reasons that I'm not gonna get into here and now, new earthen can't exist until we help them out by doing some things and unite the earthen society once more. Happily, as a result of our actions, the earthen will eventually be unlocked as an allied race. Yeah, like sweet, don't they? Yeah. These player earthen, these player earthen will replenish the culture's dwindling numbers and may join either the Horde or the Alliance. Yeah. It is, of course, player's choice which side you wish to ally with. But as you can see from a small sampling of combinations, there's some fantastic variations and customizations coming for the earthen models, including different gem encrustations, beards for all body types, rocky skin patterns, tones, and more. Now that golden mohawk with the braids and the fringe beard, that's, that's quite the look. But I really like the beardless guy with the bushy blonde uh, eyebrows. He looks so cool. He's just kind of like, yep, what do you want me to do? So anyway, all right, moving on. Another cool culture that players will encounter in the War Within is the Arathi. Yeah. Yeah, and you probably have questions, right? So these are descendants of the original Arathorian Empire, and they've arrived relatively recently and through some somewhat mysterious circumstances. And they find themselves trapped here within Khazalgar. Mysterious mostly because I can't say anything more about it just yet because of spoilers, but it's not like spooky mysterious, it's the other kind. Uh, as a people, the Arathi are worshipers and wielders of holy fire. They are dedicated to bringing hope and light to the darkness. They're tough, resilient people with every member of the society being an able combatant. Some few are further blessed with paladin-like abilities through their devotion to the light. Even their airships are powered by sacred flame. The extent to which they're comfortable in battle is probably a good thing because they have established a home away from home in an enormous cavern bordered by an endless underground sea from which terrifying creatures emerge to rampage and create havoc. Not my idea of a cool place to hang out, but they're really, really tough. These watery monstrosities, though, are nothing compared to the threat from below. A constant swarm of Nerubians has been held back so far from invading the Rathi lands. The assault is unrelenting, the threat is dire, and the Rathi can't hold much longer. These bastions of light against the darkness are far from home and limited in number. Sure would be terrible if there was also division within the Arathi ranks. Just saying. That would be pretty rough, what with them being so outnumbered. We could probably help them. All right, speaking of the Nerubians in the War Within, we'll explore their last kingdom deep within Khazalgar. These ancient survivors of the Black Empire who rejected their former masters have developed their own culture here in the deep darkness. As Taryn mentioned earlier, Zalatath has made a bargain with the Nerubian queen Anserek, who seeks a new future and renewed glory for her people. The Nerubians are extremely capable and devious adversaries who have been honing their skills with their constant assault on the Arathi. But domination hasn't come fast enough for the queen's taste, as the Arathi has managed to hold against this onslaught. So this deal with the Harbinger has included some assistance for her troops. Through some dark alchemical process, Zalatath has provided the knowledge required to evolve chosen Nerubians into paragons of their race, enhancing their viciousness. And Queen Anserek has embraced these modifications with enthusiasm, 
and eagerly offered her army to achieve the harbinger schemes. It appears to be a win-win situation. But not all Nerubians share their sovereign's enthusiasm for change and her embrace of Zalatath. Shadowy figures with far too many limbs maneuver against the Harbinger's plans in opposition to the Queen's desire. As you might expect, any foray into this Nerubian kingdom introduces us to a variety of citizens, including some forms we've never encountered before. Here's a layout of some of the Nerubian models that are completed and also some that are in progress, as well as scale reference for goblins and humans, so you just get a sense of size. In addition to the Nerubian citizens, there are also domesticated insects who serve the kingdom as beasts of burden and pets. The team is hard at work building out the full range of carapaces, car carapi, I don't know, whichever, skittering legs, grabby arms, piercing spiky bits, and creepy eyes for you to enjoy, I guess. All right, let's talk about our zones. The surface of Khazalgar is our first zone, called the Isle of Dorn. This is the home of the earthen surface dwellers, as well as other native species of creatures. The fertile soil, flowering plant life, and generous waterways provide nourishment for animals in this untouched paradise. An important facet of earthen society is cinder brew mead. This volatile substance is manufactured from molten honey, produced by enormous fiery bees. Their home groves are a remarkable sight as the hearts of the trees themselves glow with lava-like fluid. Harvesting is always an exciting time as the ferocious creatures are understandably protective of their hives. Now the roosts at Storm Watch are wreathed with lightning and fierce winds. These wild elemental rooks may choose to serve a member of the Oathsworn, who if so blessed becomes a storm rider, one of the guardian warriors of the earthen people. The Unbound deal with hostile creatures from time to time, but for their most part, the existence of, is fairly relatively peaceful, fairly sort of peaceful. Their comfortable homes are often situated near the places where they once labored as adherents to the edicts. Those sites are now in disrepair, and in some cases, the lair of other creatures. Of course, the Isle of Dorn boasts a great walled city where the Oathsworn live and serve the edicts of the Titans. The city of Dornagal is the location of many important civic buildings, markets, traders, and crafters. And it's here that a traveler will find the expected amenities of a capital city, as well as the Titan Causeway, the defense of which is the Oathsworn's primary charge. Now beneath the surface of the Isle of Dorn lies our second zone, the Ringing Deeps. As the name suggests, it is here that the earthen are engaged in their work in accordance with the edicts. In these industrial areas of this cavernous space are huge complicated machines, lava heated foundries and forges, and waterworks, both to cool and to power huge machinery. Maintaining these titan mechanisms and keeping everything running is both the responsibility and the passion of the machine speakers. The earth has shifted too in places, revealing openings to the sky above to the Isle of Dorn. These cenotes bring light and water into areas once shrouded in darkness. Abundant greenery, flowers, and creatures that do not typically dwell in caverns may be found in these idyllic spots. It was really important to us as developers that we delivered the fantasy of the hardworking industry, but still had some breakup areas of natural beauty that don't feel like dark, constrained tunnels. Now, as the machine speaker population has dropped, they've had increasing difficulties with cobalt incursions. And indeed, the cobalts have taken over the mines, the work areas. They've even built a city of their own. Unexpectedly, the cobalts are actually becoming a force to be reckoned with under the aggressive actions of their leader, the Candle King. You knew it had to be a candle. No take candle. No take candle. With the passage of time, the earthen have diminished both in number and in the knowledge required to perform the various routines to tune and repair the processes. The old ways have been forgotten, and new creative methods must be employed if the edicts are to be obeyed. So they're kind of making it up as they go along. From the ringing deeps, we descend further into Khazalgar to reach Hollowfall, a vast hollow area in the earth bordered by an endless underground sea. This tenuous foothold under the bright light of an enormous crystal has allowed the Arathi to survive. Using their airships to travel to high plateaus and establish docks, 
light towers, villages, and even a priory. From their capital of Meraldar, these trapped people strive to keep hope alive and spread the light while engaged in a near constant battle with the Nerubians at their borders. The open spaces, the bright light, and the greenery are intended to feel as though we're on the surface somehow, rather than in this sort of strange hollow within Azeroth. The crystal provides brilliant light, warmth, and growth for vegetation. You may notice that all the blooming plants have opened their blossoms toward the light and seem to be reaching in that direction whenever they're in Holofall. Unfortunately, the crystal sun has been changing in recent years. Where once the light was steady and reliable, it now fades without warning, plunging the Arathi into darkness, save where they have built light towers and maintain their holy flame beacons. In the absence of this light, the dangerous Kobis and other fierce creatures emerge from the sea to rampage. As the Arathi are barely holding back the Nerubians, these unpredictable episodes are incredibly demoralizing and deadly. Happily, the light has always returned to the crystal, so far. And at the deepest descent in the war within, we reach the zone of Aj Kahet. That almost rhymes. Anyway, the Nerubian city of Threads has been built on the ruins of itself over and over and over again. As areas decay and crumble, a new district is built upon its ruins, and as a result, the city climbs ever higher. Those Nerubians favored by the queen, or possessing enormous wealth, or both, command the greatest views and live in the highest places over these swarming masses of the many districts. The burrows is the home of the scavengers, the forgotten, deep in the decay and the filth. The Umbral Bazaar is a trading hub of fine silks, fascinating alchemical discoveries, and other exotic and hard to find goods. The skeins are the home of the lore keepers and scholars who toil to maintain the history of their people and research myths and legends of Azeroth. There are many other districts and less than savory neighborhoods, both well-known and secret, that the careful adventurer could discover should they risk life and limb to do so. But the key to such exploration is fitting in among the Nerubians and being accepted, an enterprise both best accomplished through skill in the use of pheromones and considerable bravery. The zone of Aj Kahet features areas of spectacular dark beauty that are inhabited by these creatures that have found a way to live among the Nerubians without being de deemed a threat, found to be particularly tasty to consume, or just too much fun to torment. The mobilization of forces to assault the Arathi while also providing military might to achieve Zalatath's schemes has stirred up all sorts of inhabitants of the darkness. And deep within the city itself, the Nerubians are gathering an odd substance, the black blood of the old gods, for some unknown purpose. But I'm sure that's fine. <laughs> and now I'd like to talk a little bit about our zone flow. As I mentioned, <laughs> awesome, huh? We travel from the Isle of Dorne into the Ringing Deeps, into Hall of Fall, and then into Ashkahet. In the War Within, all of our zones are connected all together using the airlock technology that we developed for Zerilek Cavern, allowing for this seamless descent from the Isle of Dorne all the way to Ashkahet. That was video I just captured last week of the transition between the Ringing Deeps and Hall of Fall. As you can see, we built for dynamic flight and we were able to flow directly between the zones without the load screen. There is some seriously amazing swoopy goodness to be had moving across these zones and through these spaces. It feels so cool to burst out of a really tight area and into just a huge drop like that. It, it's so exhilarating. Now this blobby map that I've got up here was an early attempt during development of our zone flow to try to figure out how we would stack these zones together and achieve the relationship between their geography and geometry that made sense and felt great to traverse. We ended up with something slightly different than this, but this is pretty representative to explain what the world builders were thinking about when they planned these spaces out. It was really important to our design that while three of the four zones are technically underground, they didn't feel that way and that they were distinctly different from one another. 
We pursued that goal by introducing the natural cenotes in the ringing deeps and leaning into the fantasy of the classic underground foundry and industrial workspaces. So even in the zone that felt the tightest, there's places that look as though they're actually on the surface. And within Holofall, we created a massive hollow space in a cavern so vast it feels like an exterior with a huge artificial sun in the form of a gigantic crystal. And in Aj Kahet, we leaned hard into traditional Nerubian architecture with hanging nests and huge palaces built all over a decaying city that just falls away into the depths. And that is the last bit of eye candy I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this peek at what we've got in development. So now it's time for me to introduce you to Morgan Day, who's going to give you lots of information about dungeons, raids, and systems. Enjoy. Thanks very much. Bye. Hello, BlizzCon. My name is Morgan Day, and I'm here to talk to you about some of the upcoming content, features, and systems in The War Within. I'm sure I'll also make some funny faces that I'll regret later in thumbnails, but whatever. <laughs> First up, let's talk about dungeons. There will be eight, oh, there will be eight new dungeons coming in The War Within, four during level up, one in each of the four zones that Maria just walked us through, as well as four at max level. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening in these dungeons. For instance, we have like a kobold dungeon where you'll meet that candle king, where there's like a light mechanic that takes place. You have to kind of keep it going to, to light your way. Uh, there's a dragon riding dungeon, of course. Uh, but also, one of my favorites is the Cinderbrew Meadery that Maria just talked us through. So this is a dungeon that takes place on our first zone, the Isle of Dorne, uh, which is where you'll experience you know, all of our earthen buddies. And this is the place where they make that cinder brew mead that she was talking about. You know, they take in all that honey that they gather from throughout the zone to make the mead to do all kinds of fun and or nefarious things with. Uh, although I do have to say, I feel like they're a little bit behind the times. I feel like all the kids are drinking that you know, hard seltzer or something these days, but whatever. <laughs> they're old school, I get it. Next up, our raid, the Nerubar Palace. So this is an eight boss raid that will take place in the zone of Aj Kahet. Uh, and this is really the culmination of all of those machinations we keep hearing about that we see play out between the Nerubian Empire, their queen, and her collaboration with Zalatath. So for this next one, uh, we don't normally show things this early, but I thought it'd be cool to share. Uh, on the left there, you can kind of see the top-down view of the raid. And on the right, it's more of like a side cutout. Uh, so we like to work on all of our dungeons and raids when they still look like this, as it's much easier to iterate uh, while we're in 2D than it is to kind of change the zones around once we're in the game and it's all blocked out. Uh, so to step us through the raid really quickly, uh, after barging through the front door, uh, you'll very quickly fall and or get knocked into one of those giant pits of that black blood of the old god that you'll hear much more about in Aj Kahet. Uh, and then you'll batter your way through the harvest pits, and then finally traverse your way back up through the stalactite wing, which is not a final name, I promise, uh, until you finally f fight your way into the queen's inner sanctum, where you'll come face to face with her as the end boss. Um, so as you can see, this will kind of feel like a winged raid in terms of the vibes, but in, in terms of the player experience, it'll actually be quite a bit more linear than what you might be used to for a raid with some winged vibes. Uh, so something that I also think is fun to talk about really quick is um, with all of our dungeons and raids, we like to try to explore like what is this, the thing that's going to make this space feel really unique, that's going to make it stand out from all the other times that we've built these dungeons and raids. And with this space, we really thought that, you know, given that we have the Nerubian to play with, they've got all these amazing like webs and th silken threads that you can kind of traverse uh, the zone through. We thought it'd be really fun to explore verticality as a major element of this raid. Uh, so I think that'll be really fun to see what the team comes up with for that. Next up, let's talk about systems. Uh, so I want to walk you through some of our features and systems at a really high level. But first, I want to talk about some of the philosophies that are really guiding us to add these into the war within. Uh, 
So first and foremost, uh, you know, we really want to continue to extend the philosophies of Dragonflight into the war within. And really when we talk about that, there's three main pillars that I want to touch on. First, we really want to make sure that we're focusing on evergreen features. We want to make sure that we're making World of Warcraft better forever and not focusing on things that we know we're going to have to leave behind as we move into future expansions. Next, uh, we want to make sure that there's something for everyone. So whether you're a hardcore raider, a PvPer, a collector, or apparently like Holly, you just love to play tons of alts and run around the world exploring things, uh, we want to make sure that there's something in War Within that you can really geek out over and that resonates with you. And finally, we want to make sure that we're continuing to build on our philosophy and build on our systems and content with people who play multiple characters in mind. We want to make sure... <laughs> <laughs> we want to make sure that we're building all of our systems to really respect the time of the player behind the keyboard and not focusing so much on the accomplishments of that individual character. So let's talk about delves. Uh, delves are a new feature that will be integrated into the outdoor world experience, where the fantasy of these is actually that you'll be joining the Dragon Scale expedition in their search for lost treasures all across Khazalgar. So delves are an evergreen feature that is really integrated into that outdoor world experience. We want delves to be a new pillar of end game content for those outdoor world explorers. Uh, we really view this as something like when we added world quests back in Legion. Uh, where they are going to be really integrated and transformative into that outdoor world, especially that endgame loop. Um, so one of the main reasons I'm stoked about Delves is that these will provide an opportunity for us to, you know, give seasonal content and rewards to those outdoor world explorers. So that means things like, you know, rewards that you're used to, like mounts, achievements, titles, but we'll also be adding a outdoor row to the Great Vault with War Within. Uh, so that all of you outdoor world explorers will be able to share in the joy of, you know, rushing to the Great Vault every week to collect your loot. Uh, and there will also be 13 unique delves that we'll be launching War Within with. Uh, and delves will scale from one to five players and be role agnostic. So that means if you want to play a delve solo, that's totally cool. If you want to go with you and your partner, that works as well. Or you can bring your whole dungeon group in and the delve will scale based on your group size and your roles. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of my favorite features of delves, which I think Maria alluded to earlier, which is that there will be an NPC companion joining you on all of your adventures. So, for season one, that'll be Bran Bronzebeard, as you can see. And Bran will be tagging along with you on all of your Delve adventures and will totally never, not even once, aggro a pack of monsters that you didn't want him to. And I don't have my fingers crossed behind my back right now. Uh, so Bran will have a custom... Brand will have a customizable uh, talents and mechanics and abilities uh, that you'll be able to kind of load out to suit your playstyle and needs. So, you know, maybe you need a little bit of extra healing. Uh, well, you can load Brand out to provide that for you. And finally, um, you, would, you know, wouldn't be exploring with the Dragon Scale Expedition if at the end of every delve there wasn't this massive treasure trove that we need Brand to open for us, which hopefully brought a couple of keys to open some of the chests in there. Uh, but before Bran can open that treasure, or that vault for you, you'll need to maybe defeat a, a boss, maybe you'll solve a couple puzzles, something like that, and then Bran will be able to open that vault door for you. Next up, let's talk about warbands. Ah, it's happening! <laughs> So Warbands are a system that we're introducing that will really be the representation of all of your characters across your Battle.net account. Uh, we, you know, Warbands are an opportunity for us to create a platform where you can share your achievements, resources, and all that other good stuff across all of those characters. So the goal of this system is really to be that representation of the philosophy shift that I mentioned earlier about really respecting the time of the player behind the keyboards and not those individual characters. 
Um, there's actually a ton of additions and modifications. We've talked about a few here. Um, there's no like singular UI screen that says warbands. Uh, it's more of like all these modifications and updates and, and features are like kind of wearing a big coat that says warbands on the back of it. It's, it's how I kind of keep it head in my, or straight in my head. Uh, but just to talk about a couple of those cool features, um, we'll actually be revisiting the um, transmog rules of how you acquire those, those appearances in The War Within. So for all of you who have... So that means all of you who have probably had to run four characters through all of those legacy instances just to make sure you're collecting all the appearances, uh, that won't be the case anymore in War Within. You'll just be able to run it with one character. Uh, and oh yeah, uh, Holly mentioned this already, but this is obviously one that people are looking forward to. Uh, all of our reputations as well as renown in The War Within will be shared across your entire account. Uh, last but not least, let's talk about hero talents. Uh, so here's a quick mock-up of what the UI will look like that I think really helps explain how these integrate into our current talent trees. Uh, but really quick, let's take a look at how this will work. So there will be three new ta uh, hero talent trees per class, and two will be available per specialization that you can freely choose and swap between. Uh, and also, this is another evergreen feature. This is a system that we think is gonna provide a new vector of choice and customization for you and all of your classes, as well as create opportunities for us to really dig into some of those core class fantasies that are you know, so amazing. So Hero Talents will introduce these new, small, self-contained talent trees like you just saw in the UI. And the way I like to think about it is like, currently we have two types of talent points, right? We have class talent points and specialization talent points. And now in the War Within, there'll be a third type called Hero Talent Points. So let's look at a quick example, which hopefully explains it a little bit more. This is a warrior, as you can see. These are the three hero talent trees that they'll have available, Mountain Thane, Colossus, and Slayer. And as you can see in the top left, we have Protection, who will be able to choose between Mountain Thane and Colossus. Up in the right, you'll see Fury, yep, that's right. Mountain Thane and Slayer are their options. And down at the bottom, Colossus and Slayer are their options. So this is how the majority of our classes are gonna look in The War Within. The exception, of course, being <laughs> druids and demon hunters, who are a bit special, so theirs will look a little different. So let's take a look at how you'll unlock the system, as well as how it'll, it'll feel playing through as you're leveling through The War Within. Uh, so the system will automatically unlock at, at level 71, and it'll just kind of appear in your UI. You'll earn one talent point per level as you level from 71 to 80. And there are 10 talent points in total with several choice nodes along the way. So I like to think of this as being similar to like the Legion artifact where as you were leveling and progressing, you were making some choices along the way, but ultimately you're gonna unlock the whole tree. Uh, and also I wanna be very clear here, these are uh, extremely low friction to swap between those choice nodes as well as to swap between the different hero talent trees. So, you know, this should be very analogous to your current talent trees and will follow all the same rules that you used to there. So, you know, at the start of a raid boss, you know, before a Mythic Plus starts, before an arena match kicks off, and anywhere in between. And to wrap us up, I wanted to show off a really quick video of what hero talents look like in action. So this is a warrior, as you can see, popping avatar, jumping in. And this next one is that same warrior with the Mountain Thane talent tree. As you can see, Stormbolt hits multiple targets. There's a couple of cool new V effects and a lot of other cool stuff going on there as well. I heard some oohs. Ooh. <laughs> Our effects artists will be happy. So that about wraps us up for our What's Next panel. We hope you really liked what you saw here, and if you'd like to know more, please join us tomorrow at the Deep Dive panel where at noon, where Ian will walk you through some of what you saw today in more detail, Woo, Ian! as well as a bunch of other cool new stuff in the War Within. So thank you all so much. I hope you have a great BlizzCon. Bye.